I was freezing, drunk, and barefoot in the snow. Bob Tilford opened the door. True story. Drunk and barefoot in the freezing snow, I couldn't win a card game to stave off frostbite. I was crying and pounding on the door in the middle of the night. The drunken loser was forced to run to the end of the frozen block without any shoes. I kept losing. By the third snowfoot run, my drinking buddies thought it would be funny if they locked the door. Not funny. The 60s were a long time ago, but as best I can remember, only Bob Tilford took pity on me. He talked the others into opening the door for me. Bob must have been home on leave from Vietnam at the time. He, he was a crazy son of a gun, but he was my best friend. And we were best buds from about 1962 when we met in the alley behind our homes on 7th Avenue in Gary, Indiana. I think he wanted to fight with me for absolutely no reason. And maybe it was a young alpha male thing going on. Even back then, I knew I would have gotten a bad butt kicking. It was just easier to become Bob's friend. And that was a great life choice. Bob taught me many things some good things and some bad things. But if you can't learn some stuff from your best friend, get a new friend. For example, Bob taught me my first guitar chord. We played in the band together in 1965. He played guitar, so I played the drums. Bob had terrible rhythm, but he was the epitome of cool. I was pretty certain that if the dictionary had pictures, his would be under both A and C. A for attitude and C for cool. I will dig out his picture from my bar mitzvah party. Hint, he's the blonde in the Yarmul key with attitude. <laughs> we used to go hunting, camping, and fishing together. Literally, we used to sleep in a big hole in the ground dubbed the bear trap. It was out by Sauk Trail. It was big enough for us to fit in a few sleeping bags, our guns, the required beverages, and even a little firewood to heat up the canned beanie weenies. Bob taught me to shoot the daddy long legs and miss our feet while still camped in that hole in the ground. If any of my grandchildren ever hear this, I trust they will never light fires or play with guns while camped in a hole in the ground surrounded by inebriated reprobates. Bob taught me how to jump a moving train. It wasn't until the EJ&E security guards spotted us that taught me how to jump off of a moving train. Two very different techniques are required for these feats of idiocy. I also hope my grandchildren will never learn to do these dumb things. I will buy them tickets if they really need to go somewhere to escape cruel and unusual parenting. Now, my parents must have, they must have been crazy. I mean, I don't know what was going on in their heads. Or perhaps they really trusted Bob Tilford. At 15 years old, I was determined to save my money as a bus boy at Jackson's restaurant so I could hit the road and spend the summer hitchhiking across America. My parents, well, they wanted no part of my proposed plan. But in reality, my tactic worked perfectly. They refused to wave goodbye to their young teenager with a knapsack and a thumb. However, after weeks of negotiations, they were finally happy to bargain down and allow me to go if I traveled with a responsible person and had safe transportation. From there, it was easy to convince Bob to come along. He was 17, he'd been working at Shopper's Fair, he was prepared to be the next captain of the Horseman High School swim team, and I think Bob knew that Vietnam was in his future, so he was ready for anything. And my parents loved Bob. They told him to watch out for me as Bob and I climbed aboard a Greyhound bus in downtown Gary, Indiana. 
We were absolutely amazed and free as we rode the big dog to Minneapolis. <laughs> we were both ready to see the world on our terms. We got off the bus in the Twin Cities and began an adventure hitching across northern Minnesota, embracing strangers, creating friends, and making memories that I will always appreciate. Now, to protect the guilty, I won't record the details of our odyssey, but suffice it to say that I've been traveling ever since. Bob gave me my nickname of that era. He called me Bo Ran. In the early 1970s, I produced a band called Bo Ran and the Good Folks. When I released my first record in 1972, it was composed and produced under that name, Bo Ran. Late that year, I decided to run off with a little Italian girl in early 1973. She took a new name. We eloped and she became a Weiss. We went to California. I needed to introduce my new bride to Bob. He had just gotten out of the Navy. On the way, I accidentally read a book. It talked about Jesus. I said the prayer at the back of the book. When we reached Bob, I told him what had happened to me. He asked me if I had been baptized. I had not. He insisted I take that step, and he was the only person I knew who came to my baptism. I asked Bob if he wanted to get dunked too. He was not ready yet. Anyway, Bo Rand died in my real name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then years later, something tragic happened. Bob Tilford died. It was completely unexpected. It made me think of Job. Job said, man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. I like to say it that life is short and full of blisters. Job also said, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. I believe Bob knew a change was going to come. Everyone in the 60s knew that. Bob kept his ponytail a lot longer than I did. The 60s were hard for some of us to shake. His passing reminded me of a song our band used to sing. The lyrics could have been written for my friend. The song was, Mr. You're a Better Man Than I by the Yardbirds. It says, can you judge a man by the way he wears his hair? Can you read his mind by the clothes that he wears? Can you see a bad man by the pattern on his tie? Then, mister, you're a better man than I. Could you tell a wise man by the way he speaks or spells? Is this more important than the stories that he tells? And call a man a fool if for wealth he doesn't strive. Then, mister, you're a better man than I. Could you condemn a man if your faith he doesn't hold? Say the color of his skin is the color of his soul? Or could you say if men for king and country all must die, then mister, you're a better man than I. Bob was always a better man than I was. He was better to his parents and he cared for them throughout their old age. He was better to his friends and went to any length to help anyone in need. He was better to our nation as he risked his life in service to America. He learned to be better to the land and to the environment where he farmed and earned his living from hard work and creative techniques. But in the end, he died like every man will do until the Messiah comes. I heard that Bob was praying when he went. 
That was very comforting to me and to his beloved family. You know, in the final analysis, we will all meet our maker, whatever the verdict. We can be sure that as was recorded in Job, God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserves. In other words, whatever difficulties we experience in life and whatever we face in the hereafter, we probably had a lot worse coming than we got. And anything good was gravy from God. Now this message is not about God's goodness, grace, or gravy. It would better be about beautiful Becky Tilford's biscuits and gravy or William Robert Tilford's farm-raised catfish that will forever be missed by all in Skull Bone, Tennessee. Really, I just wanted to say a few kind words about my friend. I miss him. When it happened, Adrian and I drove off to Tennessee, Skull Bone, Tennessee. The funeral was in Bradford. After the wake, I was asked to speak at the funeral. We were driving from a hotel in Martin, Tennessee, when our cell phone rang. My wife answered the call. <sighs> she was immediately thrown into a crying panic. She was hysterical. All I could hear was my baby girl screaming out of control into her phone. Confused and scared, I missed the turn to the funeral home and ended up in the next town. A speeding driver had run a red light. My daughter's car was smashed. That was all we knew. A construction worker on the scene took the phone and explained that an ambulance was on the way. I walked into the funeral home in a daze as my introduction was announced. It was a stirring moment. My friend, of a lifetime was in a casket without warning. My 19-year-old daughter was in an ambulance instead of at Bible College where she was headed. No plans are certain except the plans made by God for our lives. Our plans can change in a heartbeat or the unexpected sound of shattered glass and crushed metal Funerals are intended to comfort the family. I read the lyrics to that old yard bird song that our band used to sing, yet the only comfort I could imagine was that death is certain. It is only the time that cannot be known. It is also certain that the best of us and the worst of us are guilty of at least a single sin, and by definition, a single sin makes one a sinner. No person can say they have never sinned. The only question remaining is, who pays the price for our sin? Ah, I remember. Yeah. I remember being drunk and barefoot in the freezing snow. I was a loser. It's quite embarrassing. I was actually standing out at that door in pain, crying. It was pretty pathetic. A crying drunk out in the freezing snow without any shoes or socks. I was a loser. Bob took pity on me and let me in. I was drunk. Who really remembers the other drunks that laughed the loudest or the one who unlocked the door. Any sinner could have opened the door for another sinner to swallow another drink or lose at another game of blackjack and snowfoot. Heaven is a different story. Who holds the key to heaven? Heaven is a place without sin. No person can say they've never sinned. The only question remaining is who pays the price for our sin? I know that answer for my sins. Do you? If you knew Bob Tilford from Horseman High School in Gary, Indiana, I'd love to hear from you. 
If you need the answer to your sin problem, trust Jesus. After the funeral, I got the report that my daughter was in one piece. She was bruised but not broken. And when everything calmed down, we were able to rejoice in the goodness of God and His divine protection. But none of us should take our next breath for granted. That car, the car that hit my daughter, was clocked by the police at 62 miles an hour when the constable did a U-turn to try and stop the driver. It was too late for law enforcement, but not too late for her guardian angels. By the way, a word to the unwise from a brilliant bumper sticker. Never drive faster than your angels can fly. Meanwhile, if you have any thoughts about this little message, drop me a line. Till next time, Shalom.